Well, howdy there, Internet people. It's Bo again. Don't worry, you're not watching the wrong channel. Just roll with it. Our next panel, our next guest is the mother of political prisoner reality winner. She is here to speak to us about her daughter's case and tell us a little bit about how to get involved. So without further ado, we have Billy Winner Davis. Hello and welcome. How are you? Hello, thank you for having me on. I'm I'm doing okay. I'm doing as well as can be expected. Absolutely. Yeah, we're really definitely understandable that uh with everything going on that it would not be uh the best, but we hope you are doing well considering the circumstances and I'll let you take it away to let our audience know about your daughter's case. Okay. So um, for those who have not heard of Reality Winner, my daughter is Reality Lee Winner. She is now 29 years old, which is hard for me to even say. Um, my daughter was arrested on June 3rd, 2017 at the age of 25. My daughter was charged with the unlawful transmission of national defense information which is a law, a charge under the, an espionage act. And so she was actually charged with espionage. What my daughter did was while working with the NSA, she came across a document that had the proof of the Russian attacks on our election systems in 2016. And this was at a time when our administration at that time was denying any kind of Russian interference in our 2016 election. And they were trying to cover it up. They were calling it a hoax. Um, Jim James Comey, the FBI director, wouldn't let it drop. And so Trump fired him. 
And it was at this crucial time that my daughter took it upon herself to print a copy of that NSA report and mail it to a media outlet called The Intercept. And within a couple of weeks, my daughter was arrested at her home on June 3rd. And my daughter basically has not seen a day of freedom since. She was denied bail, which is absolutely absurd. You know, they, they called her a flight risk, even though they took her passport, even though she didn't have the means to, to flee anywhere. At that point, you know, her, um, her picture had been all over national media. Um, you know, our family is not well off. And so, you know, but they called her a flight risk and they denied her bail. They kept her in horrible, horrible conditions in a small rural county jail in Georgia, which you can only imagine what that was like for her. And through the charge with the Espionage Act, basically she was beaten down. When you're charged with the Espionage Act, it means that you basically have no defense. There's, there's, no, there's no defending yourself and saying, you know, I'd leak this for the better good of the country because you can't even mount that defense. Um, the jury in the case would not even know what document was leaked. They would just know that a top secret classified document you know, which with national intel was leaked to the media, which yes, is against the law, but you don't get to tell your side of the story. You don't get to tell, you know, um, what the document was, the fact that the document didn't do any harm to our national security. The fact that the document was actually meant to warn us, to, you know, help us um, to protect ourselves, to protect our voting systems, to protect our country from an attack by Russia. And so, you know, my, my daughter was basically beaten down through the entire process. The court ruled against her at every turn. It was, it was so biased. Um, you know, they even petitioned the court to quash her confession because my daughter was never read her Miranda rights. And the court never even ruled on that. Um, you know, it was just to see what happened in her court case was just something that you would never, ever expect would happen in the United States. And so my daughter ended up pleading guilty, taking a plea deal, um, basically to get out of the county jail system and to get some help. And they, um, they gave my daughter the longest ever sentence that a person under this charge has ever received in the United States. My daughter was sentenced to 63 months in prison with a three year supervised uh, period after her release. And then she has lifelong conditions um, that she'll be under for forever. Um, so right now my daughter is, she's going on her She's already served three years and eight months of her prison sentence. She is currently at a federal prison in Fort Worth, Texas, Carswell, Car Carswell Federal Medical Center. They call it a medical center only because it has a hospital on the grounds um, for the sickest of the federal female inmates. But, you know, that name shouldn't mislead anyone because my daughter is in a federal prison and it's maximum security. And, you know, she's, she's having to, you know, live life in prison. And right now she's suffering because not only is she in prison, but the prisons are on a lockdown status because of COVID. Um, and a lot of people don't understand what's happening within our prisons and our jail systems today with COVID, it basically has given um, the authorities the, you know, um, I guess the right to violate all of their rights, you know, to basically lock them down, to offer no programs whatsoever, um, to even restrict them from nutrition and to restrict them from recreation. So, I mean, that in a nutshell is basically um, who my daughter is. Um, you know, prior to 
working at the NSA. She served in the United States Air Force for six years. She was a cryptolinguist. Um, she's fluent in Farsi, Dari, and Pashto, which the Air Force taught her. And um, she was actually uh, given a commendation medal prior to her honorable discharge for her outstanding service and work protecting our nation. And how can people get involved with her case for freedom? Well, my daughter has um, petitioned for clemency with the Office of the Pardon Attorney. And, um, you know, we really petitioned for President Trump at the time to release her because, you know, he actually tweeted about my daughter's sentence, indicating that it was unfair. You know, he actually recognized that her sentence was record breaking and that it was unfair for the one single document that she released. But um, here we are, you know, Trump didn't act on any of that, didn't respond to any of our requests. And uh, so now we are trying to see if President Biden will act on her clemency petition and commute her sentence and at least bring her home. Um, at this point, we're not act asking for a full pardon. That can come at any time. What we just want is we want her out of prison. Um, my daughter also did petition the, the Bureau of Prisons and the courts for compassionate release back in April when COVID started spreading through the prisons. And we saw at Carswell that the numbers were going up and up and up. And it was only a matter of time that, you know, she, you know, became infected with COVID. But the prisons, of course, they, they basically indicated that they had never seen her petition to them. Then they changed their story and said, well, you know, that they would deny it. The court, the judge, it had to go back to the same court that sentenced her. And that judge basically said that he didn't have the authority to rule on compassionate release. And even if he did, he would not grant her compassionate release. And he also denied her any kind of hearing. You know, they requested a hearing to, to you know, prevent, I mean, to present the case, to present the facts to present the reasons why reality should be let out. And he wouldn't even give them a hearing. And so they appealed it. And finally in November, the appeals court heard the case and they ruled against her. And so basically she has been denied any kind of compassionate release. And so we're kind of stuck at this point. So what we really need is we need um, everyone to do their part, to write to the White House, to call the White House, to write to their representatives and their senators. Um, we need to raise the volume and we need to make sure that this administration hears us, that this administration hears that reality winner is supported by thousands of people out there and that we all believe that she is a political prisoner in the United States and that her sentence was overly harsh, that she has served enough time and that she deserves to get out. You know, the judge, even at the time of her sentencing, admitted and stated that he had no doubt that that would be the last time that reality winner would ever see the inside of a courtroom. You know, she poses no threat to society. There's no doubt that she's going to come out and lead a life, uh, follow all of the rules, obey the laws, and that she's never going to break the law again. And so when you think about all that she has suffered and the time that she has spent incarcerated, you have to ask, what is the purpose at this point? What is her incarceration you know, serving at this point? It's only 
serving to torture her. It's only serving to punish her. And there is no correction going on here. There's no rehabilitation because reality winner doesn't need re rehabilitation. You know, the judge actually stated that she's not going to break the law again. You know, you look at my daughter's life prior to this, and she has absolutely no criminal record whatsoever. Like I said, she joined the Air Force right out of high school at the age of 18, and she served honorably. She has volunteered in every community that she's ever lived in, and she has just this record of community service. And here, this is the person that was not granted clemency. This is the person that was denied compassionate release. This is the person that was not granted a pardon when the last president was issuing out hundreds of pardons to the people who donated to his cause, the people who were his friends. You know, my daughter didn't, you know, get a pardon during all of that. And so, what we all need to do is we need to make sure that we tell this president, you know, through our representatives, through social media, through actions, that we want Reality Winner released. We had some questions from our DLive viewers. Um, folks were curious um how do you feel about your daughter when looking about your daughter's case when looking at the treatment of similar whistleblowers and political prisoners such as edward Snowden, julian assange chelsea manning and others who have either had to flee or be, you know, or have suffered other harassment by the state for their whistleblowing actions? Right. That's a really good question. Um, you know, prior to my daughter's arrest and, you know, us being thrust into this world, I had zero exposure to any kind of uh, whistleblower environment or community whatsoever. Um, you know, since this, you know, I've, there, there is, has been outreach by others, you know, to our family and there's been support. Um, I, you know, my daughter's case is so much different than Chelsea Manning's and then um, Edward Snowden's and Julian Assange. Um, her, her case is so much different. The one single document that she released was actually about an attack on our country by a foreign enemy. You know, so that's very, very different. And what what's happened is it's been difficult because there's there's some groups that don't want to recognize her as a whistleblower because they're saying, well, she didn't expose waste, fraud, abuse from our systems within. And that's true. But what she did was she blew the whistle on an attack on our country, an attack on our voting systems. And so while her case is very, very different, you know, we've had to even just fight to get her recognized as a whistleblower and to get that recognition and to get that support. You know, I think that, you know, in today's, you know, um, environment, everybody recognizes the name Edward Snowden, Julian Assange, um, and most people have heard of Chelsea Manning because they become household names, you know, and everybody has an opinion, good or bad, about who they are, what they've done. But we're still battling with people not even recognizing the name Reality Winner. People, there's people out there who have never heard of Reality Winner. There's people out there who have never heard of what's happened to her. And, you know, we're always questioning why, you know, and it's because, you know, she's not recognized immediately as a whistleblower like the other ones. And so we always try to educate people. She didn't, you know, blow the whistle on internal things. She didn't, you know, expose fraud, waste, abuse 
within our government. But what she did was she did blow the whistle about an attack on our country by a foreign government. And she did expose information that our government was trying very, very hard to keep covered up, to lie about, to say was a hoax and try to divert our attention away from. You know, after my daughter released the information that she released, you know, those 21 states that she released the information about, they had no idea. They were asking the questions, why weren't we told? Why weren't we told that our systems were jeopardized? You know, and then you have the Senate Intelligence Committee actually using the very document that was that my daughter released as part of their investigation. They wouldn't have even known that that document existed if she hadn't been the one to release it. You know, so to me, she is a whistleblower. She brought this information to the light. Um, you know, with regard to Chelsea Manning also, uh, Chelsea Manning was still in the military. And so her court process was very, very different than realities. Um, my heart goes out to Chelsea Manning for everything that she endured. You know, she, she was tortured. She really was, um, you know, a political prisoner. And she suffered for seven years inside of a prison. And actually, she was actually at Carswell, where my daughter is, for a time. And she was held, you know, in their max max there. And so my heart goes out to everything that she suffered through. Um, and she still isn't done, you know, as we know, she was then, you know, arrested again, because she stood up for her principles. You know, um, Edward Snowden um, has become somebody that, you know, has become somebody that I had no idea about his story, his case, I didn't know what he had done, you know, um, since this time, and really since he has spoken out in support of reality, you know, I've, I've read his book, and I've come to admire, you know, him and what he did, everything that he sacrificed, you know, he gave up his whole life, um, you know, just like reality did, you know, to do something that he felt was needed to expose, you know, something that he felt was so important that we know about, you know, he gave up his freedom and his life. And, you know, there, there are people, you know, who don't um, agree, you know, with what he did, or they feel like he's living the good life there in Russia, you know, but I have the utmost respect and admiration for Edward Snowden. And, you know, it just, it struck me when he was on the 11th hour with Brian Williams and he was asked, would you ask Trump for a pardon? And he said, yes, but he wouldn't ask for a pardon for himself. He would ask for a pardon for other people like my daughter, Reality Winner. And that just, you know, told me everything I needed to know about who Edward Snowden is and what he's about. Another viewer question, uh, how do you feel about your chances of, of getting clemency from a Biden administration? I have absolutely no idea what to expect. We have heard nothing. And I know that we've made noise. I know that, um, I know that he and people around him know her name and they know about her case. I have no idea what to expect as far as whether he would be um, open to, you know, looking at her petition for clemency. I understand that, you know, the Obama administration was the administration that really began the attack on whistleblowers, that they're the ones who who pretty much um, started using the Espionage Act against people who released classified information, whether, you know, regardless of the reasons behind it or regardless of the good that it did. And so I don't know how Biden feels about, you know, um, whistleblowers or 
um, you know, the use of the Espionage Act against people who expose information like this. I, I hope that he will be open to, to looking at this case, looking at it fully. You know, my daughter's service to her country was never, ever taken into consideration, such as, you know, you have Petraeus, you have General Flynn, that people are saying you need to take their, their contribution, their service, you know, into consideration. But my daughter didn't get that. Basically, what the U.S. government did is they weaponized her service against her. They said that because she speaks all these languages and she's so, you know, involved in, um, you know, looking at the Middle East, you know, because that's what she did for a living. That's what she did to protect us. You know, they basically said that that made her an asset that she could easily run away and join the Taliban. They made that up. You know, if you read my daughter's commendation medal, my daughter saved us from terrorists. She identified targets and she was responsible for eliminating enemies and targets to protect us and to protect, protect our troops on the ground. You know, but they used her service against her. Um, I know I'm, I'm going off on a whole tangent, but what I really want from Biden is for him, for him to just give us a forum, give us a chance to present to him who reality is and what she's done. And, you know, to look at what's happened to her through this, to look at what the last three years and eight months of her life have been. She has paid a heavy, heavy price, and it's time to bring her home. Um, I have actually, you know, requested a meeting with President Biden and requested to talk with him. You know, they said I had to put my request in writing. I've done that. I send a request to the White House almost daily asking him, you know, to, to contact me or to at least look at her petition for clemency, you know, to please, you know, review this and consider this. I know that my daughter's not the only one right now in prison that deserves attention, that deserves clemency, but I, I you know, have to fight for her. She's, she's a good person. She didn't deserve this. You know, what, what she did for our country, um, she did it to protect us. She did it to expose the truth. And I know that Biden knows that. I know that he has talked about the Russian interference in our election. And he's talked about the fact that the previous administration did everything that they could to cover this up and to lie to the American people about this. He talked about that in his campaign. And so I would just hope that he will look at this fairly and, you know, act on it. Another viewer was wondering if you think how much you think the whole Russia gate um, conspiracy theory conversations have to do with your daughter's case being overshadowed and really ignored. Oh, I think a hundred percent. I think that that's why pretty much they denied her bail and they kept her hidden away. Um, she's under a gag order. She's been under a gag order from day one. Her attorneys were under a gag order. They did it so that there wasn't a lot of spotlight on her case. You know, that's another reason why, you know, she's not a household name like Edward Snowden is, you know, there was this gag order and no one could, talk to her. No one could talk to her attorneys about what was going on. And they did this because they wanted to keep it very quiet. They didn't want people to start, you know, really looking at, hey, wait a minute, you know, the Russians did this. And even today, you know, trying to get support and adv advocacy and awareness for my daughter's case, from the start, there are certain groups who don't want to, 
you know, for us to say what she released. They'll support reality winner, but they don't want to say reality winner exposed the Russians attacking our election because there's this, you know, this, uh, there's groups out there that, that don't want to go there. They don't want to involve the talk about the Russian interference on our elections. One of our other viewers was curious how this experience has changed your view on prisons and our prison system and if it's made you more aware of the various inequalities and other problems within it. Absolutely. Uh, you know, prior to my daughter's arrest, I was a social worker. I worked with CPS, Child Protective Services, for 26 years, over 26 years. Um, when my daughter was arrested, you know, I was fortunate enough that I was close to retirement. And so I could, I was able to buy out some of my time and retire so that I could actually relocate to Georgia to be there with her so that she wasn't, um, you know, I alone and isolated, you know, and, you know, no one real close to me has ever been incarcerated before. And so this was a brand new experience for our entire family. We, we had no idea um, the do's and don'ts, which, you know, showed pretty early in her case in that they used a lot of our telephone conversations against her, you know, because we didn't know, you know, that, yes, I mean, the recording comes on and says this call may be monitored, but you don't know that the federal government is going to be using all of your words and they're going to be twisting them. They're only going to be taking certain pieces of your conversation and then they're going to be putting them together in to create a, a puzzle, a picture that they want to create. And so, you know, that was a rude awakening. And then, you know, just the fear, you know, her being there in Georgia and us having to get up there as quickly as possible. I was positive that she was going to get out on bail. I mean, why wouldn't she? She has no criminal history whatsoever. She served her country. Um, you know, what she's being accused of is not a violent crime. Um, I was willing to relocate to be her anchor she could be on a monitor. They took her passport. Um, you know, why wouldn't they allow her, you know, out on bail? But they, they denied her bail, which I didn't understand. And so she was trapped in that county jail, you know, and just, I mean, the, the stories, um, everything that she's had to endure, you know, the entire one year and 83 days that she was there at that county jail, the roof leaked right over her bunk the entire year. And it rains a lot in Georgia. And so she had to endure that. You know, she was in a central holding, a female holding that, you know, up from 12 to 16 female um, inmates, detainees with her. And this was anyone who was arrested coming off the streets. This was people who were intoxicated, people who had mental health issues, people who had, had um, medical issues. This is people who were coming off of drugs. You know, she, she had to experience all these different things that she never experienced before. And what we found out, you know, through her county jail experience really quickly is that if you don't have money in the United States, you will be a prisoner in the jail system. Um, you know, and the violation of rights that goes on in our criminal justice system. You know, there were women in there who didn't even, weren't even formally charged, and they would be in jail for up to two weeks without formal charges. You know, I didn't think that that was legal, and it's not legal, but it happens. Um, you know, the, the substandard care of detainees and inmates in county jails and in prisons. You know, the inmates get the bare minimum. You know, the fact that my daughter, she's, she's vegan, which means that she doesn't eat any kind of animal products whatsoever. 
and she's also Jewish, and so she follows a kosher diet. Well, the rural county jail in Georgia, they had never been exposed to vegan or kosher, and she had to try to educate them, but they were not going to bring in special food for her, and they were not going to cook special meals for her. So my daughter, really, all she ate that first year was canned vegetables, which were full of sodium, and she ate peanut butter, potato chips, um, and oatmeal. I mean, those that's what she lived on for that year in 83 days. Um, our We had um, some supporters who actually reached out to some local churches and were able to get a, a local church to donate fruit, fresh fruit, for the entire jail once a month. That's the only time that they got fresh fruit. Um, the medical care is just horrendous. My daughter was injured because she fell at the courthouse and she injured her knee and just the care that she didn't receive for her knee was, was just outrageous. She was attacked by another inmate while in that county jail and she was injured, had a head injury, you know, and they couldn't protect her because the emergency button in that cell, in that holding cell, never worked. So they were not able to summon any guards when this inmate was attacking my daughter. You know, they, they had to fight for everything within that system. They had to beg for toilet paper. I mean, imagine, you know, you're a grown woman and you want to be clean, but you've got to beg for toilet paper, you know. And then there's when my daughter was sentenced, you know, what they do is they don't tell the detainee or the family or the lawyers or anyone when they're going to be moved for safety reasons. I understand that. But they move them in the middle of the night you know, 1 a.m., 2 a.m., they go in and they wake them up and they basically take them out and they transfer them. Well, my daughter had released her property to me prior to this so that she didn't want to lose letters and postcards and, and books and things that people had sent to her. So she released her property to me. And when she released her property to me, they released her clothing her street clothes that she was wearing when she was arrested. So my daughter, they won't, they won't uh, transfer you in an actual jail uniform. So she had to be transferred in the only clothing that she owned, and that was long underwear. So they drove her from Georgia to a detention center in Florida. She was supposed to be flown out the next night to Oklahoma City, but there was issues with that transport. And so she was detained in Bakers County, uh, Florida for about two weeks. And one of those weeks she was kept in solitary confinement because they ID'd her as a high profile prisoner. And so she had absolutely nothing. They even, the only possession that she was allowed to take with her was her Bible. They took away her Bible and they put her in solitary confinement for a week until we made enough noise to get her out of solitary, you know, and to at least get put into general population. Um, from Florida, again, then she was flown to Oklahoma City in her underwear. And then she was put on a bus and she was taken to Grady County, Oklahoma, where she was put in a holding facility for overflow um, from the Oklahoma City um, Processing Center. And this was basically a county facility. And there were 95 women in one big holding room. And there was one bathroom facility, one shower for 95 women. And they held her there for, I think, five days. And she said it, it was just the filthiest environment she's ever been in in her life. I mean, if you just imagine that. And she finally, finally was taken to where she's at right now, Fort Worth, Carswell. And um, 
you know, within prison, you learn that you pretty much have to, you have to learn the system, you have to learn the game, you know, not only with the guards, but also with the other inmates. And it's all survival. Everything is survival within prison. And so she's had to, you know, adapt to that and learn that. And just as, you know, she was feeling, you know, that at least, you know, I could, she could do this. I can do my time. You know, she had a, a job. She was teaching fitness and nutrition at the rec center. She was also taking college courses. And so she had other things to occupy her time. She had access to, you know, drawing and painting and art projects and things like that. Well, then COVID hit, you know, and when COVID hit, like I was saying before, the prison systems went on what they call modified operations. And basically what they've done is they've shut down all programs. So she no longer can go out to work because her programs are, are canceled. She can no longer do college courses. Um, there's no longer recreation. There's no longer art programs. There's no longer classes for them to take. Um, they are basically caged. And, and then there's been times where, you know, if um, somebody within the unit tests positive, then they go into even stricter lockdown conditions. They go into quarantine where they're basically stuck in their rooms and can't even go out to a common area to socialize or watch TV and, you know, um, to at least stretch their legs, you know. And these rooms are very small. Uh, it's four women to a room and there's not even enough room for two of them to stand up at a, in a time. So imagine being quarantined, isolated for a period of days, you know, you're basically stuck on your bunk. Um, yeah, this, this entire experience has just, um, shown us a world that we never, ever expected to see that we never ever expected to experience. Um, and, you know, she and I have, have made an agreement that when she's released, you know, she and I are going to do whatever we can to uh, do what, whatever we can to work toward reform, criminal justice reform and prison reform. You know, um, she realizes that her story is not the worst story out there. She has seen so much during her time and she sees the abuses and she definitely sees the abuses against minorities and poor people. And, you know, she really wants to fight for change uh, going forward. One of our other viewers was curious if you have seen the documentary 13th or read the book, uh, The New Jim Crow by Melissa Alexander. And if you're aware of the issues surrounding, you know, the 13th Amendment and prison slavery. Yes, um, that actually, uh, anybody who knows reality, reality likes to give people assignments. She always has all her life. She gives you reading assignments. She gives you movies or documentaries to watch. And even prior to her arrest, she had told me about the documentary 13th. And so it was on my list of ones that I had to watch. And I did not watch it until after her arrest. Um, and then when I did watch it, it, it definitely opened my eyes to um, how the United States has used prisons and jail and our whole criminal justice system as a continuation of the slavery in our country. And, and again, like I say, through this experience that we've had with my daughter and her telling us about the stories, the cases out there, especially, you know, her being in rural Georgia, um, you know, it's, it's still ongoing. And it's just somebody has to stop this. I, I don't know, 
you know, how this can continue to go on in today's world. I just don't understand how they can violate people's rights, you know, and, um, you know, abuse people within this system. And, and for people who aren't exposed to it, like I say, I, I'm guilty because prior to this, I had no exposure to this. I, I was, you know, in my own bubble and I didn't know. And I probably, if I had seen 13 then without having the personal connection, I would have thought it would have been horrible, but it probably wouldn't have affected me as much as it affects me now, you know, having her in there, her telling me about other cases. You know, just the other day, she asked me to do some research on a case to see if, you know, this young man who will probably get sentenced to life in prison, um, you know, to see if there's anybody that could help him. You know, and so I'm trying to research that, uh, you know, it, it's just, it's, our system is so, it's, it's a nightmare. It's, it's a total nightmare. And the fact that people with money and people with connections uh, can buy their way out of jail, out of prison, can buy their way out of the criminal justice system is something I never expected to experience, but yes, we're experiencing it. And, and Trump just made it, I mean, he just made it right there, right in front of our faces, you know, about that. Yes. If you are connected to the right people, if you are uh, white and if you are rich, then you don't have to do your time, no matter what your charge is, no matter what your crime is. One of our other viewers was curious, what do you think of the claims that China interfered with this recent election through their connections with the Biden campaign and Dominion voting machines, supposedly? Yeah. I am going with the mainstream media when they reported that uh, all of the states had looked at the possibility of election interference, of election voting fraud, and all of that, and that they didn't find any. I'm going to go with our um, national intelligence communities when they released the information that this was by far the safest election that we have seen. That's what I'm going to go with. I have not seen any kind of concrete information to say otherwise, to, you know, um, support any of those allegations. And I don't think there are any because otherwise we would have seen them. You know, you can say that there was voter fraud, but prove it, you know, and probably the silliest thing that I heard was, you know, somebody was interviewing on a podcast, they were interviewing somebody who basically was saying that there was election, there was voter fraud, there was voter fraud. And they said, well, where's the evidence? And this person said, well, I need evidence that there was no evidence. I mean, they, there's no evidence that any of this happened. And our intelligence communities are telling us that this was safe. And, and all of our states um, that, you know, investigated this, all of the courts where this was filed, they threw it out because there was no evidence. There was no basis to say that there was any election interference or voter fraud this last time. So, I mean, that's what I go on. What can we do to secure our democracy against such interference as we saw in the Oh, um, 2016 16 election. Yes. Well, the very first thing that we have to do and we must do is acknowledge that it happened. You know, um, Mueller report says that there was a whole lot of um, communications and things going on between one campaign and the Russians and the Senate Intel 
committee. And also I know there was um, a bipartisan group that also, or, or even a GOP group that came out and released their report said that absolutely the Russians interfered in the 2016 election, but you still have people out there who are believing when they're told that it was a hoax, when they're told it was a witch hunt. The very first thing that we have to do as to protect ourselves is to say that this happened and that we were attacked. And then we need to say never again. And, you know, whenever that, you know, whenever there's even a, a possibility that something like this is happening, um, our government needs to acknowledge it. I think that they need to be honest with the American people about what's happening. You know, if they had been honest with us from the beginning, my daughter wouldn't be in prison. There'd be no need because we would have known that our voting systems were attacked by Russia. You know, I always go back to why, why weren't we told this? Why couldn't our government tell us that we were under attack? I, I still don't understand that. You know, and I just, I, I, I know that now looking back, you know, Obama went to McConnell and wanted to, you know, release this information during the campaigns. McConnell said, no, we're not going to do it because, of course, it would, you know, tilt the scale as far as one campaign and the other. Um, you know, but here we are in 2021. All of this information is out there. The document that my daughter released, that's not fake. That's real. That's real concrete proof of what the Russians did. And it wasn't just the social media piece. This was them actually trying to get into our voting systems. And, you know, they, they you know, after the document that she leaked and after more investigations, they found out that this happened in all of the states. 100% of the states, and they don't know if votes were changed, you know, so I don't understand why today we're still having to have a discussion about this being a hoax. It wasn't a hoax. It absolutely happened. In order for us to protect ourselves from this happening again, we, we need to believe that it happened, and then we need honesty and transparency from our government. I need to know that if we're under attack again, that my government is not going to lie to me again, like they did in 2017. I need to know that there's not going to have to be another young person out there who's going to throw away, sacrifice their freedom and their life so that we know the truth, you know? And I hope that every America Every American out there can say the same thing, that we want the truth from our government. You know, we're supposed to be a country governed by ourselves, for the people, by the people, of the people. How is it that our government keeps secrets from us when we're the government? How is it that our government lies to us? How is it that we have to have whistleblowers leaking the truth and then being, you know, charged with espionage. I mean, that makes no sense in the United States of America. Final viewer question. So are you saying that Russiagate is not a hoax? Well, I, absolutely. Russiagate is not a hoax. The Russians interfered in our 2016 election. Um, not only did they launch a huge social media campaign and, you know, divided us on social media and they continue to do that. And they did that very successfully. But they also sent spear phishing emails to election um, people so that they could get into our voting software and our voting systems. And we know that they did this in favor of one candidate. We also know that they were involved with getting all of the emails from both the Democratic and the, the Democratic and the Republican parties. And we know that then they dumped the Democrat 
emails, but they never did anything with the Republican emails. Um, you know, we know that they did this. So Russiagate is not a hoax. And then if you've read the Mueller report and you see all of the communications, all of the connections, you know, there's no way to deny that there was a connection between the Trump campaign and Russia. You know, um, again, you know, our um, attorney general, he spun the Mueller report, how he wanted the American people to hear it. But if you actually read it, you know, I, I didn't read it. I listened to it in podcast. And to me, it was very clear what had happened. So Russiagate is not a hoax. And you don't How have to believe. But you don't even have to believe me. You just have to know that my daughter is in prison right now. And she's been in prison for three years and eight months because Russiagate is not a hoax. If the document that she had released was fake, why would she be in prison? So where can people write to reality or how can people write to reality? Um, where can people keep updated on her case and get more involved? Um, yeah. So we have a website and it is standwithreality.org, O-R-G. And you go on the website and her address is on there. Um, in order to write to her, you need her registration number. Uh, there are some do's and don'ts with regard to writing to her. Uh, they no longer accept any kind of greeting cards, no colored paper, no colored envelopes, no stickers, no glitter. Uh, you can't even use an address label. If you write to her, you can't use a P.O. box. You have to use a full name. You can't abbreviate anything. Uh, they're pretty strict right now. They, they look for ways to reject her mail at this point. And so um, just, you know, just be aware that if you do send something, it might get sent back to you, but don't give up, you know, keep trying. Because if you give up, you've let them win. And we can't let them win. Um, also on the website, all of the court documents are there. So if you want to see, you know, what kind of a fight was launched against my daughter, uh, all of it is there. Information about a play. There was a play that was uh, developed uh, based on the word for word um, transcript of her interrogation by the FBI at her home. And, and it's just, it's, it's thrilling. Um, it's, it's hard to watch, um, but it really happened. There's a documentary that's coming out in March. It's going to be featured in the South by Southwest Film Festival here in Austin, Texas, and it's all going to be digital. So you can look up South by Southwest if you're interested in the documentary. Um, there's also a motion picture planned, and right now they're in the process of, um, you know, getting the the cast together, um, filling you know the, the cast and. There's tons of articles on our website, standwithreality.org, all kinds of news articles, um, links to, to articles that you can read. Um, there's also our Twitter handles uh, that you can start following us on Twitter. There's also Facebook information. There's a Facebook page called Friends of Reality Lee Winner. Um, you can you know go on there. And so, you know, just tons of information on the website, standwithreality.org. So please visit the website and um, look at ways that you can help. Awesome. Well, thank you for joining us this evening. It was wonderful having you. Um, and I'm glad that we were able to bring at least some attention to your daughter's case. And hopefully we can get people involved and drum up some more awareness. So we wish you the best of luck. And I hope you have a good night. Okay. Well, I appreciate it. I really appreciate it. Anytime that I can speak about her and 
can maybe um, one person, you know, that didn't know about her case, you know, now knows and will go and look. And, you know, that's a person we didn't have before. So I really appreciate you having me on. I really appreciate you coming on. And again, you have a wonderful night. You too. Thank you.